Aloha Owina La. This is Kaui Lucas, and you are watching Hawaii is My Mainland, Friday afternoons, 3 p.m., where we try to keep it on the bright side and off the grid. Today, I have a very dear friend. She is on the show for the second time. Last year, she um, graced our studio, and she's back in town again from Seattle, where she currently lives. And this woman has done so much in her life. Um, she's proud to say that she's um, 78. No, no, you can't. Don't oh. say it yet, because I want to use it. All right. OK. So, well. no, so no, everybody <laughs> forget that. <laughs> forget that. Anyway, Alice Ann and I have known each other a few decades. Um, she has um, changed my life in many ways, in different capacities, um, through her many workshops that she led. Many of you have probably known her through them everything from writing to Reiki. Um, Alice Ann is a, a well-known internationally as an avant-garde filmmaker from the 60s, 70s? 60s, 70s, yeah. Yeah. And as a um, former Mary Prankster. Which if, no one <laughs> in this, at this radio station has ever heard of. So well, we anyway, give it I'm so glad that you're in town, and I get to enjoy your God. amazing presence again, and we get to talk about some juicy things that some people don't think are juicy anymore. Well, yeah, age, age is juicy. So um, we start with that. We start about age. Yeah, yeah. So yeah let's talk about, about age. We need that photo. So um, we have a photo of who's the photo of? It's your, of my mother. Your mother. Okay. There she is, the darling, sitting on our lanai in Haula, Hawaii. And she is the age I am now. And when I look at that, I mean, so she was a very powerful woman, active in the community, um, enthusiastic, clever, intelligent. And here she's pretty demented. But I look at the difference. And I can remember when I was a teenager with my best friend Mel Lee, and we would look at our mothers and we would think, are we going to get to a point where we have really ugly hairdos and wear icky clothes? I mean, <laughs> will that happen to us? And, and what will make it happen? Well, it didn't. I mean, there's some kind of very interesting generational thing that occurred between the generation of our mothers, my mother was born in 1913, hers approximately the same, and us. So that's a preliminary thing. The second part is that um, where I live now in Seattle, Columbia City is the little neighborhood, and I was in- Columbia City. Columbia City, it's part of Seattle. Okay. And I was in this very cool women's clothing store, um, Eileen Fisher. And a woman walked in, and she was wearing this rather remarkable outfit. She was wearing wide striped pants and a beautiful gray large fedora, just dynamite, and um, a long Eileen Fisher jacket that was kind of like Japanese stitching. And she had a scarf tied around her neck. And she had those little. Um, combat boots, but you no know, sort of female combat boots. Sure. And I was looking at her and thinking, is she my age? I mean, is this woman? What was her hair like? Uh, her, you couldn't see her hair because of the hat, but later oh, she took okay. it off and it was short blonde hair. So in my typically graceful way, I went up to her and said, do you mind telling me how old you are? Because <laughs> I wanted to know if she was younger or older than me. And she said, I'm 78. And I said, well, I'm 78. And then she said, well, actually, no, I'm really 77, but I always say I'm 78. And I said, <laughs> I'm really 77, but I always say I'm 78. And we both just howled like that was the funniest thing in the world. So that's the first point, is that something, we shared something that has to do, for me, <clears throat> with testing the water. So. I've been saying I was 78 for about six months, <laughs> although I'm not 78 Yet. until August. August. <clears throat> now, here's the other part, and this leads into our second subject. 
I also recognized that she was dressed like a woman who is no longer having sex. Oh, and what does that look like? Well, you know, it was an elegant jacket, this kind of, it was chic dressing, mm -hmm. but it was totally non-erotic. There was no eroticism. Now, I would say generally that that is not how I, how I dress. <laughs> <laughs> I dress like an old teenager usually, which is perhaps not a good thing. But um, I'm, I'm sort of noticing that I've always been curious about age since I was a little girl. Didn't you exaggerate your age when you were a little girl? Say, mm. You say, I'm nine, but I'm almost 10. Um, I might have. I might have. But I had an older sister who was sure to correct me if I did, so <laughs> I'm not sure there was much. So you were stuck. Yeah. Um, age seems to have changed dramatically between now and, and my mother's generation. Well, your generation, the baby boomers, have mm. absolutely transformed every stage of life. Every stage of life, yeah. I think so. Yes. I mean, I think... Yes. Um, Nobody noticed until you guys hit puberty, but um, certainly ever since then, and I, I... So now I have to mix up age with the psychic thing. Okay. Um, I just want to say, because we haven't done the intro on the psychic thing, that you are uh, a practicing psychic at this point. You have been for a long time. But you didn't start out life that way. And you were well on your in a very fine academic com career, oh, yeah, yeah. teaching literature yeah. at, a, at a college, so, um, and when all of that happened. So, so I don't want to repeat all no, of that. But I was, finishing, I was finishing my doctorate at Cal, and I was a full professor of English and Humanities. Um, and I met a psychic. Okay, now which, we'll just jump forward. Yeah. And as a consequence of which I went to England and trained and, you know, became a professional psychic, which initially was humiliating for me because I was an intellectual snob. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and when people are psychic, you don't imagine generally someone who's very well educated. It's associated in our culture with, you know, fortune tellers, basically. Fortune still, tellers and flakes, still yeah. Things. I have to say, you're, you're, it's, a, it's rare to meet mm. one as well educated at, as broadly as you. Well, remember, though, in book club, we read that book by the MD, who was a psychic MD. True. You know, yeah. I mean, that's not, it's, it's less. But she doesn't go around practicing psychic, though. She, she wrote a book about how she uses her psychic abilities in her in her medicine. medicine. Yeah. And then there's Julie, Julie Mox. Anyway, so it was, how, how did we get to that? I wanted to say something about. You were just um, uh, going on to about. Go back to it. Um, the, the, the being, talking about age and then becoming oh, yeah. a okay, psychic. Okay, so I wanted to say that thing about being a psychic because I communicate with non physical energetic beings. I mean, doesn't that sound that sounds crazy? But that's my experience. And sometimes a voice actually speaks to me. Most of the time, I just feel that I'm being directed by them, like the little nickel reading I just did. That was fun for, for our, our floor manager today. Our floor manager, yeah. he there was information that he really needed, and he was there. It was I had to do it, you know. I I had to do that. So. Um, because I communicate with them, and uh, how's that? How is that ben, connected ben. with with age? With age. Um, oh, so anyway, we we're just saying baby boomers. My I call, I call them my guys, which is very cavalier. I mean, who knows? They may be gods or something, but in my experience, they're talking to me, and I'm familiar with them, and they don't. They categorize people not generationally the way we do. We talk about baby boomers, millennials, whatever the Gen other X, ones are, Gen X, X etc. They talk about soul groups. And the soul group that is more familiar, familiarly called baby boomers, which is huge, it's not a single generation, it's almost two and a half generations. My daughter, 
whom you know is also in it. So it starts, I'm a kind of outrunner, I'm at the very early stages of it in 1939, and it lasts, I can't remember when the, when the next uh, switch is. But what they say about my soul group, and I'm really embarrassed to say Donald Trump's soul group, because <laughs> he's in the same group. And if you understand that, it does help understanding him a little bit. We're the ecstatics. And what that means is, if we're not having an ecstatic experience, we think something's wrong. <laughs> this is our great weakness. And I, I mean, I apply that to him. I apply it to myself all the time. I think, so you've, got to get, you've got to be a little serious here and not constantly be seeking more ecstasy. And the ecstasy, of course, connects with being old and still having great sex. I mean, I would say I'm possibly having the best sex of my entire life. Wow. So there's hope. Well, I think it's good to know that at 78, yes. and it's not like I haven't had good sex when I was younger, <laughs> as you also know, since you know. I wasn't part of it. Let's just since, since you know my former husband, who's a gorgeous, divine man. Anyway, that's sex. So, so I'm going to say that your soul group, however, Yes, I'm, I'm at the, the the tail end of the uh, boomers. Really, not a boomer. I'm no, a, you're technically not. Um, you are the next soul. Group. Yeah, the, you and our dear friend Barack Obama are in this, the next soul group, which is very small. It's not even a generation. Ah, maybe that's why they have a problem labeling us. But yeah. you know what you what I you know yes. what it is. You what call is us it? the you clean have to up say. crew. <laughs> cleanup team. They're the ones who had to come in and you take care of the mess that we made. Yeah. Some of us made. I didn't make much of a mess. I made a little bit of a mess. And the one after that, though, boy, do we need some of them. The millennials? No. Or I before th that, the Gen Xers? They're the ones, it, it, would be, it would be in more common terms, the generation after you. Okay, so I'm in the, the post-boom, but not really Gen Xer, so I'm in the early 60s. I was born in 63. Yeah, but you're so a cleanup team, Obama's clean up team. cleanup team. I'm the next generation. I'm not sure exactly what the cutoff date is, because yours is so small. I mean, they're comp but the next team are the peacemakers, which is really interesting. And it may be that, I don't want to get into politics, but we may just skip right over if we do need some cleaning up. It's going to, there will need to be some cleaning up. So your team is going to have to get to work. But the thing about the peacemakers is that they have this innate ability for like calming troubled waters, for smoothing things down, for getting things running comfortably. I mean, they're, they're pure hearted. I have a lot of young clients, well, relatively young clients. I think they're in their 40s now. 30s and 40s. Let's see. Yeah. In fact, Gruber and I have several friends from that group. And they have this gift. Well, our, two of our good friends are, are high profile, very successful tech people whose business is the security of tech. So they're. Internet security. Internet security, but. Um, and they both have very responsible, elevated positions. And what they're doing is bringing peace to a place now where things are getting a little dodgy. It's kind of like the Wild West now in the tech world, you know, in, in the As we've world. seen with the malware that came out last week. As we have seen. So, and the people from that soul group, their, their, their strength is their gift for making peace. Their weakness is that they have to learn that sometimes peace comes with too high a price. Too high a price? Yeah. Pyrrhic peace. So you have to be very conscious about that. OK. Because so, if you sacrifice something in order to have peace, it can collapse. So there has to be muscle behind it, basically. OK, let's take our, our little break now and come back and explore that a little further, because it sounds really important. OK. You can be the greatest. You can be the best.
Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas, and with me today is a dear friend, uh, author, psychic, filmmaker, lots of other things, Alison Parker. So, Alison, we were just talking about you. You just mentioned um, that peace, peace, the peacemaking peace come generation may come at too high a price. What do you mean by that? Well, if you're, let's say, you're, you're politically engaged and you're negotiating a deal and you give up too much. You have to find a way. You have to be f forceful. You can't just surrender in order to have peace. You have to have some muscle behind it. So it's a tricky business because the goal is to have the goal for this soul group is to have everything moving smoothly. And if they're not really conscious, <clears throat> they can give up too much for that. And what would the consequence of that be? Well, what happens when you give up too much for something? It's a big loss. Yeah. It's a big loss. It doesn't serve the larger world, the larger community, whatever you're involved in. Anyway. OK. So you were telling me when we were <clears throat> thinking about what we might chat, um, something about how athletics and, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and, and being a psychic are, 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 are somehow. Well, this is one of the things that is has always fascinated me. And I was subject to it because as I said, when I first saw my, my first psychic, I yelling, and she said, oh, you've always thought you're so smart. Well, you're pretty smart, but you're really, really psychic, you know. I cried for two weeks because there was my whole life gone. She saw you. She, she saw me, and in seeing me, something in me just went, wow. And I, and I knew it was correct. And then I understood why I'd always done so well on tests. Because? Well, I was sitting next to somebody who was really good. And I don't, I mean, it's not that I didn't know the information, but you're in the, f the f field energy of someone. No, I mean, God, I'm so pretty smart. But un unwittingly, I was, I, I could take, <clears throat> I love the tests that had just yes or no answers because I could just go down yes, no, no, even without reading the question. <laughs> and I thought, God, this is so good. Oh, and then once I was teaching at the Art Institute, well, I was teaching at the Art Institute, I gave humanities lectures, and it was to the entire student body. I mean, usually it was for one year, but if it was an interesting lecture, anyone could come. So there'd be you know, a couple hundred people there. And, and I loved it. It was really interesting to me, I uh, could, speak on this. I, I had specific subjects I was covering, but I had complete freedom there, relatively speaking. And I was in a faculty meeting, and I said to the other humanities teachers, isn't it amazing how when you're lecturing, suddenly there are all these things you know that you didn't know before? And they said, no, no, actually, that, that's not really how it works. <laughs> I thought, well, it works that way for me. You know, I'm thinking, what were the days of Jonathan Swiss major works? And suddenly, bang, 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 there they are. <laughs> That's apparently not common. So it was a real asset. And I remembered that I did that, and I thought, oh, that's how. I just thought, well, maybe they were back there in the depths of my mind, buried, filed somewhere, and suddenly they magically rush forward when you need them. Now, however, my memory is just completely it's, it's not like clouds, but it floats, it floats in and out. And I, that brings me back to my mother. My mother was demented, and she became, she became an infant, basically, a large, very messy baby that we took care of until her death. And for a while, as my memory started to waver around, you know, I think, Wow, um, what is my zip code? <laughs> and maybe I'll remember my zip code from here. Speaking of which, it's so nice to be here. I'm so homesick for Hawaii. I'm just, oh, just loving it. So I was thinking, am I getting demented? 
But as far as I can tell, and I test it with Mr. Gruber, Michael Gruber, because he will recognize if I'm less conscious. My experience is that I'm as conscious as I've, as I've ever been, but that m memory patterns, specific things, are kind of awash a lot of the time. And usually I'm quick enough that if a word is gone or a name is gone, I can finesse it. But initially that scared me. And, and actually I wanted to talk about that because I think Many people my age now are experience, experiencing memory loss. And when you start... Many people my age are experiencing well, right. memory Yeah, loss. it happens in your 40s. Well, it depends on how much you drink and if you do drugs also. I think that's probably relevant. Um, so it's good to know that as long as your consciousness is intact, what you remember and don't remember isn't really all that important. You can look it up now. And, and I think memory loss is also connected with access to the Internet when something is always there and you can look it up. I mean, think of oh, primitive cultures. Yeah, have oral these. tradition. Well, let's not use the word primitive, but let's look I at like it. I like primitive as a word. OK. I mean, would you not want to be primitive? Um, not really. Yes, you would. I would like to be indigenous. You're, you were a hula dancer. Anyway, okay. So that's another anyway, discussion. Of a place. So uh, non, um, so not a not writing culture, an oral a culture with oral traditions where you had to your You have your, to remember the entire Iliad you, and the Odyssey. Right. That's a lot to remember. Yeah. But it strengthens those muscles and now That's, we don't use those muscles. And they're and and, it, and I think it's all right. I don't think it's a bad thing. So how is we gonna, are we still talking about sex? I wanted to connect that with oh, sex. You wanted to connect memory with sex? No. And when I'll talk about the psychic thing again. I'll go back to the question you asked me. Um, our culture, what do you want me to call them, primary cultures? Uh, our, our culture, modern culture? No, no, no. The, Pri not, the, no, the first nation, first peoples? First peoples. We'll call them first peoples. First people have, <clears throat> generally speaking, a more highly developed and more comfortable connection with what I'm just going to call the larger world. Or, or non-physical. Non-physical reality, however yes. you want to describe yes. that. And as we developed specific cultures that are based on communication and language and words and, writing. and written language, that ability has diminished, but it's, it is a natural part of being a human being. And my experience is that everybody, I mean, so there's this, this thing called being a psychic, and you think of it as, as a, a special group of people, but in fact, all that happens is that you are embracing, I mean, all that happened for me is that you surrender and embrace to a larger reality. You surrender to a larger reality and embrace it, and if you're lucky, you don't get messed about, you know? I mean, the larger world is really larger. It includes all that is, which is kind of a tricky business. You have to be able to sort through it a little bit also. I remember you talking about a workshop where um, you became aware of that. Oh, okay, right. So, so I was talking about my mom and her dementia and taking care of her. And at that point, we were, I was living at Buddha Buddha, which is the property in Haula that my husband and I owned. And I did all of my readings in person. So I had my beautiful office overlooking this gorgeous property. And I'd be working with the client, and my poor darling mother would suddenly open the door and come stumbling into the room wearing only a diaper. Yeah. <laughs> which is very disconcerting both for me and for this poor person who's there having the reading, right? So do I, should I continue or shall we break? Well, let's just, you know, we have about another minute and another a half. Minute. So. Okay, so what I thought was, I wonder, because when I was working face to face, I link to the person and connect with their reality pattern. Yeah. I thought, I've got to find a way to do that on the phone. 
and I did. I learned to go to the person and I connect at the crown and when I'm in, they feel it, I feel it, and then it opens up for me. Okay? Can I go on? Do I have time? <laughs> so, 30 seconds. So then I was thinking, I was doing a, a, I think I was doing a psychic development workshop and I thought, gee, I wonder if I can train people to do this. I mean, I thought, whoa, I am really good that I can do psychic work with people all over the world now. And my clientele at that point started expanding. I still had clients in England. So what happened? So what did you do? Well, I have to give you it in detail. So I'm having the workshop and I decided I'll test and see if I can train people to do this. So there were some 20 odd people and I lined them up in two rows with about 15 feet between the rows outside and the front row is facing in that direction. The back row is facing in that direction. There's exactly the same number. And I said, okay, I'm going to go to you, the people in the back row, and I'll touch you on the shoulder. And at that point, I want you to connect with the crown, connect with the person who's in front of you. And those of you in front, when you feel someone who connects with you, raise your hand. And then I went at random down the line. And every single time I'd touch someone, they'd start connecting or sending, and that person would raise their hand. And I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? It took me 20 years to figure this out, and now all I have to do is tell someone to do it, and they can do it? Well, that is a great message of hope. You've given <laughs> us at least three. One, that, that we can have great sex well into our 70s. Um, and probably beyond, well, you can come we'll back see, in a few years right? and you can tell us about that. Yeah. And um, that um, this, this too shall pass, what we are presently experiencing. One and books. there are generations um, already born who are well equipped to um, make things peaceful and smooth and well functioning well, and we yeah. need to support them. Yeah, and they're, they're moving into place as yeah. we speak. Yeah. So the I love having you back. Come back more often. Thank you, Bye. Howie.